Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Jax Wexler. I run Social Design Sydney and the Systems Change Salon. Um, the other night, we had a really great meetup about design justice. Unfortunately, the recording did not work. So I am re-recording the teach component of the event so that um, people who couldn't make it um, can still hear what happened and maybe other people who are interested might be able to learn a little bit about design justice. Um, I'm not an expert on design justice, but I have been following it for a little while and um, most of the material comes out of the design justice book. Um, so hang tight and I will share my screen. Um, before I begin, I would like to um, acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation in the place where my feet are today. And I would also like to acknowledge the um, elders past, present and emerging in the place where your feet are planted today. So let's hang tight while I share my screen and we can um, have a little chat about design justice. So design justice. I'll just run through the agenda of what we did in the event. Um, we did a quick hello and then we did the um, design justice principles and theory, pretty much what I'm going to go through now. We then did a short group reflection session where we talked about the principles, had a break and then um, used a framework in groups for an hour where we looked at some of our actual um, projects that we were doing and use the framework which I'll introduce you to you today at the end of this. And then we had a share back with um, reflections and a discussion. So um, for, for you, sorry, for those of you that don't know me, um, my name is Jack Swetzler. I run um, Social Design Sydney and I also consult at Sticky Design Studio. Um, I see my practice or my professional life as having three prongs. I'm really passionate about learning, sharing and doing. And I do this through these three bodies. So Social Design Sydney, um, I host events and masterclasses, mainly about change practice, a lot of design, but it's actually a lot of just other sorts of social change practice. I consult as Dickie Design Studio, so I offer human-centered design co and co-design consulting, as well as capability building and mentoring and coaching. So if you're interested in change and um, design and um, do get in touch. And I also run this other group called the Systems Chain Salon, and this is a salon event today. And these are meetups um, where we do kind of experiment with different um, tools and different sort of um, topics, and it's really a forum for learning. Uh, I won't go through these slides. This is just um, some of the aims of Social Design Sydney. Um, we have an event happening next week. So if you happen to be interested, um, please do come along to this. Uh, so I'll just tell you about the salon. It intends to build an experiential community of practice of diverse participants who are interested in social and systems change practice. Like the European Salons of the Enlightenment, the Systems Change Salon is a place for the exchange of new ideas, experimentation and doing. So I hope to see you come along potentially at some point. Um, we have a Slack channel. So if you're interested, um, please do sign up. People, um, members of the community share events and links on here. So um, please do join if, if you are on a Slack. Um, we did a little intro, which we won't do now. <laughs> So I took um, most of the material in this um, pack from this book by Sasha Costanza Chalk, um, Design Justice, Community-Led Practices to Build the Worlds We Need. Fantastic book, cannot um, recommend it highly enough. I have used a lot of quotations from the book, so please excuse me for the reading which will be happening. I really just tried to pull out some of the key points that I felt were um, most pertinent. So design justice is a framework for analysis of how design distributes benefits and burdens between various groups of people. Design justice focuses explicitly on the ways that design reproduces and or challenges the matrix of domination. White supremacy, heteropatriarchy, capitalism, ableism, settler colonialism and other forms of structural inequality. Design justice practitioners feel that we have an ethical imperative to systematically advance democratic participation in and community control of all stages of design. Design justice urges us to one, consider how design, affordances and disaffordances, objects and environments, services, systems and processes, distributes both penalty and privileges to individuals based on their location within the matrix of domination and attend to the ways that this operates at various scales. Questions the Design Justice Network asks about how design currently works. Values, 
What values do we encode and reproduce in the objects and systems that we design? Practices, who gets to do design? How do we move toward community control of design processes and practices? Narratives, what stories do we tell about how things are designed? How do we scope design challenges and frame design problems? Sites, where do we do design? How do we make design sites accessible to those who will be most impacted by design processes? What design sites are privileged and what sites are ignored or marginalised? And pedagogies, how do we teach and learn about design justice? So I've just outlined some key concepts. I've borrowed some YouTube videos for this. So um, I, I will watch them in a sec. The first one, which is really cute, is um, about intersectionality and kids explaining it to each other. Talk to you about intersectionality. You know what that means? You want me to explain it? Yeah. So intersectionality is a concept that allows us to realize that people live like multi-dimensional lives. So for example, if someone is a black woman and they're black and they're also a woman, it's important to look at the possibility that they may experience sexism as well as racism at the same time. So are you saying that like, say sexism is not experienced by like, everyone in the same way. Exactly. Thinking about and being conscious of the fact that we have a bunch of different things that make up our identity. Um, yeah, does that make sense? Yeah, that kind of makes sense. Mm -hmm. if, because I'm light-skinned, mm -hmm. and people think that I'm white, but I'm First Nations. Mm -hmm. Intersectionality also is like a big puzzle from your toes to your head, tip top of your head. I, I don't know, I don't understand how, what this is actually meaning. Every single part that's in you has to make you, you. Oh, no, I get it. I get it now. So people aren't just the one picture. The whole picture basically has to need your whole entire personality going together to make you. Wow, thank you. That's really cool. Mm. High five. Girl, you have to do this because boys have to do this. Only, only boys can go to this specific club. You have to have this certain amount of Pokemon cards to be in this club. Mm -hmm. And that's basically what it goes like. Um, okay, so the matrix of domination, what is that? So um, Patricia Hill Collins, um, she, I think, first wrote about it. So it comes from Black Feminist Thought. And what it says is that um, the interlocking system of oppression based on race, class and sexuality. And some questions that we can ask. How do our practices and products support the matrix of domination? Where do I personally sit on this matrix? Where do the rest of my design team and our partners and collaborators sit on this matrix? And something that I haven't noticed, noted there, but where do our funders sit on this? Where do the um, initiatives funders sit on this matrix as well? It's another question to ask. I really like this quote. Design is a process by which the politics of one world become the constraints of, on another. So now I'm going to play another video, which um, or it sort of um, reflects microaggressions in terms of um, AI. So I'll just share my screen for, give me, I'll just share my. Now I'll show another video talking about um, AI and micro. Ref this video, which you may well have seen, is a fantastic video and, a, and an example of algorithms and um, how that may be experienced by people as a microaggression. My heart smiles as I bask in their legacies, knowing their lives have altered many destinies. In her eyes, I see my mother's poise. In her face, I glimpse my auntie's grace. In this case of deja vu, a 19th century question comes into view. In a time when Sojourner Truth asked, ain't I a woman?
Today we pose this question to new powers, making bets on artificial intelligence, hope towers. The Amazonians peek through windows blocking deep blues as faces increment scars. Old burns, new urns, collecting data chronicling our past, often forgetting to deal with gender, race, and class. Again I ask, ain't I a woman? Face by face, the answers seem uncertain. Young and old, proud icons are dismissed. Can machines ever see my queens as I view them? Can machines ever see our grandmothers as we knew them? Ida B. Wells, data science pioneer, hanging back, stacking stats on the lynching of humanity, teaching truths hidden in data, each entry and omission, a person worthy of respect. Shirley Chisholm unbought and unbossed the first black congresswoman, but not the first to be misunderstood by machines well-versed in data-driven mistakes. Michelle Obama, unabashed and unafraid to wear her crown of history, yet her crown seems a mystery to systems unsure of her hair. A wig, a buffon, a toupee, maybe not. Are there no words for our braids and our locks? Does relaxed hair and sunny skin make Oprah the first lady? Even for her face well known, some algorithms fault her. Echoing sentiments that strong women are men. We laugh, celebrating the successes of our sisters with Serena smiles. No label is worthy of our beauty. So wherever we contemplate developing machine learning systems, we need to develop intersectional training data sets, intersectional benchmarks and intersectional audits. The urgency of doing so is directly proportional to the impacts or potential impacts of algorithmic decision support systems on people's life chances. Without intersectional analysis, we cannot design any objects or systems that adequately address the experiences of people who are multiply burdened within the matrix of domination. Design justice is a framework for analysis of how design distributes benefits and burdens between various groups of people. Design justice focuses explicitly on the ways that design reproduces and or challenges the matrix of domination. Design justice is also a growing community of practice that aims to ensure a more equitable distribution of design's benefits and burdens, meaningful participation in design decisions, and recognition of community-based indigenous and diasporic design traditions, knowledges, and practices. So this is a schema that I've borrowed from a talk I went to. Um, I will post the link as well in this video. Um, it was put, hosted by the Design Justice Network. And this is a, um, a schema to show how design processes generally works at the often works. So the pink are the, the designers um, and the outside are the people that are being designed for. So the process is usually done by designers designing for. And what, does, what, what can occur from this process? Um, design justice talks about um, benefits and harm, and this process can result in benefits for the more powerful and um, le less benefits for the least powerful within that power dynamic and within that, pra that usual practice of design. And in look, looking at harm, um, the, least, the less powerful are, are harmed more so than the more powerful. So just thinking about some situations where, um, you know, design teams go in to do some type of research and then end up delivering services that um, marginalised communities end up paying for. There's a really great book that talks a lot about this um, 
winners take all highly highly recommend that book which um, reflects some of this thinking as well okay so the question as well is as question to ask yourself is with this in mind so it's something to ask yourself is your practice extractive are you taking ideas back to people for them to buy from you without giving monetary rewards or credit where it's due Here's a snap of a um, empathy map that's used a lot in um, design thinking toolkits and so forth. Um, too often lived experience people are not included um, within research and these empathy exercises is standing in the shoes of often serves to codify assumptions that groups have about particular particular cohorts and to um, to reinforce stereotypes. So um, just something to, to be aware of that this empathy kind of empathy activities, um, unless lived experience people are involved, unless we actually have the voices of lived experience, it, it is not representative and it, it is actually harmful. Um, the other thing as well that we need to think about is that we need to recognize that wherever there are problems, those most affected have nearly always already developed solutions. That existing solutions that come from those most affected are likely to have the advantage of being based on local materials, skills and infrastructure. That infrastructure that people who are from and work directly with, the most affected communities should be included in and control design processes that are meant to benefit them that sometimes, although not always, external resources can best be used to support, improve, scale, and or reduce the cost of existing locally created solutions that barriers are often not about a particular tool or object, but a social, cultural, and economic in nature. There is a lot in that paragraph. A lot of community development practices actually already, there were a couple um, of community development practitioners on the call um, the other day. They were, um, you know, talking a lot about their practices in community development, about being asset based and raising up the things that are already existing in community, the bright spots, and actually helping to actually build those, utilizing the passions and of local communities. Um, design, we don't, off, we don't do that enough I don't think um, I think we come in we want to we work for a client we um, we are not we are often not raising up what's there already um, yeah okay another thing that I found in this book really um, worth calling out is about scape, scoping and framing so the way that a problem is conceived and framed has real implications design challenges act as anti-politics machines how do institutions frame and scope problems for designers to solve in ways that systemically render structural inequality, history and community resistance invisible? Ultimately, the chapter maintains, sorry, that's a chapter from the book, we need a shift from deficit to asset based approaches to design scoping. We also need community leadership in design processes during scoping and challenge definition phases of a design cycle, not only during the gathering ideas or testing out solutions phases. Too often our, um, our problem framing actually um, supports structural inequalities. Um, yeah, so something to be really mindful of. I was really um, quite my, my ears pricked up quite a lot when I was reading up about scoping and framing and, and we need to call it, we need to call um, the structural inequalities that are related to the issue. It's not about just, you know, let's just design another app. Is that app, is what is it really solving? Anyway. Okay, so this is how design processes should be. We should have the recipients of the, um, the product or service in the center, leading the, cent leading the process and the designers as enablers on the outside. That is what the design justice um, movement is um, hoping our we can move towards to, to create more just design practice and processes. So we have 10 principles from the Design Justice Network. I'm gonna read out these 10. Um, so the first one, we use design to sustain, heal and empower our communities, as well as to seek liberation from exploitative and oppressive systems. Two. We centred the voices of those who are directly impacted by the outcomes of the design process. Three, we prioritise design's impact on the community over the intentions of the designer. Four, we view change as emergent from an accountable, accessible and collaborative process rather than as a point at the end of a process. We see the role of the designer as a facilitator rather than an expert. 
We believe that everyone is an expert based on their own lived experience and that we all have unique and brilliant contributions to bring to a design process. We share design knowledge and tools with our communities. We work towards sustainable community led and controlled community led and community controlled outcomes. We work towards non exploitative solutions that reconnect us to the earth and to each other. Before seeking new design solutions, we look for what is already working at the community level. We honour and uplift traditional Indigenous and local knowledge and practices. If these resonate with you, you can sign on to these network principles at the Design Justice Network. So these were the 10 principles that were established at 2000, in 2016 by the Design Justice Network. What we did in our um, workshop is we then broke into some breakout groups and, and discussed the principles. I took a lot of this material, as I mentioned from the book, but this talk um, is really, really good. So I highly recommend this talk if you'd like to hear more from Sasha and she can talk through her experiences and her ideas probably a lot more eloquently than I can. So highly recommend it if you are interested in following up more. Highly, highly recommend that you read the book as well. Um, so this was just the prompts for the, um, the breakout room. What resonates for you? Why? What doesn't resonate for you? Why? So that's what we discussed in groups. And this was the framework. So we spent about an hour using this framework. So this comes from um, the Design Justice Network and it's um, a framework that um, says who was involved in the process? who benefited and who was harmed. So what we did is we broke into groups and um, we considered those three kind of three lenses and um, a person from each group would volunteer a project that they were currently working on or had worked on in the past. And as group in groups, we, um, we talked through the framework asking that person questions. And what some of the groups did, which was quite interesting, was they actually used the 10 principles to help guide that dialogue. So I feel that um, the groups found the um, process quite valuable. It was quite interesting to observe the, the story sharer um, really kind of thinking through those dimensions of their practice and through the process that they went through and really kind of seeing how some of the decisions that were made, how they actually harmed and how they actually um, benefited other groups and sort of really um, able to see the, um, the, the power dynamics of the, the process. So that was what we did the other night. Um, please, um, yeah, hope this was useful for you and, um, Come along next time. We have, um, if you'd like to join the Social Design Sydney e-newsletter, socialdesignsydney.com, and we have a Facebook group as well. If you would like to come to any of our other events, we've run stuff on the kind of loop model, Three Horizons framework, um, and some other things. So come along. It's fun if you like this kind of stuff. All right. Thanks for listening. Bye.